Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you all. Yes, please go ahead and type your name into chat for me. Very good, I appreciate that. Very good. So <laughs> I hope everybody's doing well, having a good week. Today, we're going to be talking about aseptic technique in the laboratory. I know you're working on lecture material this week, including the prokaryotes and separately the eukaryotes. <laughs> No problem, Chelsea, I've got gotcha. you. <laughs> so this week you're really delving into cellular structure and uh, cellular functions a little bit more um, with those two lectures. It's important for us to remember that microbes are found in all three domains of living things. We tend to think about bacteria when we think about microbes. And yes, bacteria are a lot of what we deal with in the laboratory anyway, and in clinical medicine. Remember the bacteria and the viruses are the two big bad boys of infectious disease. But it's important that we remember that there are a lot of microbes, in fact, most microbes that don't cause disease and that live around us in the natural world, and in and on our bodies, we interact with them constantly and we, we never know it because they don't bother us. So all three domains contain microbes. And remember a microbe is a single celled microscopic organism. Oh, Valerie, I'm sorry to hear it. Um, remember, if you're having internet issues anytime and you drop out of a laboratory, um, I totally understand it happens. Um, do your best to come back in if you can. If you can't, remember that the recording for the lab will be posted later on that same day. So um, I do understand, believe me. <laughs> I live in Hillsborough and we don't have the best internet here either. So I understand the, the trials and tribulations of um, Wi-Fi, believe me. <laughs> but also remember that sometimes when you get kicked out or sometimes when you can't get in to a Zoom meeting, often the best way to handle that is to just try again. I don't understand how Zoom works, but I know for myself, there have been times when I just had to back all the way out and then come back in and, um, and it worked. So, all right, it's really good to see everybody here. I'm just looking through the chat. Okay, so, before we get started on anything today, let me ask if anybody has any questions. I saw that um, several of you had already viewed the prokaryotes lecture and had taken the quiz yesterday. So um, if anybody has any questions at all about lecture material or about what we talk about in lab, um, anything at all, anything that's in the news, um, I am a news junkie myself, and I love science news. So if anybody ever has any questions about anything related to microbiology, feel free to bring those questions um, to our meetings and um, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, not, not a problem at all. I enjoy it. All 
Oh, I'm glad. Valerie's saying that um, it's helpful sometimes to hear things again and again. You are so right, Valerie. Studies have shown, in fact, that the way that we really truly learn information is by relearning it. Um, I often tell students that, you know, we take biology in high school, and then depending on what you're interested in, you might take it again in college. You may, if you go to graduate school, you would take it again. And the reason we do that is because it helps us really learn it. So when it's an important point, I'm gonna repeat it through the semester because it reminds us and it helps us to sort of cement it into our memory. I find it's, it's especially helpful when we repeat things under different context. Um, I think that helps as well. So I'm glad you find it helpful. All right, so I'm gonna just jump onto our Canvas page for a minute so we can take a look at what's coming up next week. We have a very busy week next week. Hold on just a minute, bear with me. See if I can get this, okay. So what you should be seeing right now is our Canvas modules page. And I'm gonna scroll down. We're here on the week three, on the week of June 7th. And of course, today we're gonna to be talking about aseptic technique. And uh, you will have laboratory homework as always, due Sunday by midnight as always. Um, but we're gonna take a look at what's coming up next week. Busy, busy week. Okay, so next week you have your first lab practical exam that comes up on Monday. And then on Wednesday, you have your second lecture exam. Yikes, two exams in one week. Now you know why I think it's important that you're allowed to use your notes during the examinations because I think it's an unreasonable thing to ask you to commit so much material to memory so quickly. So let's break down lecture and lab for next week. Because of the exams, there's only one lecture topic next week, and that's an important and difficult topic. Next week's lecture topic is the acellular microbes, viruses and prions. Now I will say that the material about prions is very, very short, only a couple of slides. The bulk of that lecture is about the viruses. And this quiz, this lecture quiz is due by Tuesday at midnight, not Wednesday. And again, that's because you have a lecture exam. So it's gonna be important just like last time that you watch this lecture and complete the quiz before the exam on Wednesday because you won't be able to answer certain questions if you don't watch that lecture. Now, the lecture exam takes place on Wednesday and covers the lecture topics that we've done since the first lecture exam. So prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and acellular microbes, those three lectures. Just like last time, the exam will open up at seven o'clock in the morning, just in, just in case you wanna take it early, and it will be due by eight o'clock at night. You can take it any time during the day, but you have to complete it once you begin it. You get one chance, in other words, to take the exam. And just like last time, you are free to have your lecture notes by your side. So your job this week, as you're watching these lectures, will be to get a nice, detailed, organized set of lecture notes for yourself. Now, for laboratory next week, there's not a Zoom lab on Monday. And that's because you'll be taking the lab practical exam on Monday. So it's a little confusing, I know, but when we have a lecture exam in this course, we still meet for lab. 
But when we have a laboratory exam, we don't meet for lab. And the idea is, especially around the labs, that in theory, you could take the lab practical exam during the time when we would meet for lab, because those two things are completely related to each other. You don't have to. It will be available to you from seven o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night. But you could tuck it right into the time that we would meet for lab. Just like with lecture exams, you have to, ooh, I'm going to change this right what is it, as I'm seeing it. That should say 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You have to complete the exam once you take it. You can use your laboratory notes while you're taking the exam, but no other materials. So remember, this is a lab exam and there will be no questions on it from lecture. There will only be questions associated with what we've been doing in the laboratory periods so far. Now, it's important to remember that the lab exam and the lecture exam have slightly different formats. And I'm gonna show you what I mean. I'm gonna go back into the modules and zoom down. So here's the link for the lecture exam. You'll click on that when you're ready to take it on, um, on Wednesday morning, that's June 16th. When, you're, when you are ready to take the lab practical exam, this is the link that you will click on on Monday morning or whenever you take it on Monday. Now, you probably don't see this link yet or you can't click on this link yet. Um, and that's because it is set to open up on Monday morning but I'm gonna go ahead and click on it because I wanna show you how the lab practicals are different from the lecture exams. Remember on the lecture exams, you go into the exam, you read questions, and most of the time you're asked to um, pick an answer from a group of answers, multiple choice questions. The lab practical is a little bit different because it's laboratory related. A lot of what we're using in the questions is images and diagrams and things like that. So what we do is we put the lab practical questions in a document. Can you see that there? Questions for lab practical exam one. So what you're gonna wanna do when you sit down Monday morning is you're gonna wanna open up this questions document in one window and have this page open in another because you're gonna type your answers into this exam. Let me show you what it's gonna look like. So you can see here, question one, there's no question written down. It just says answer question one here, and you're gonna type your answer in. The question is written on that document that I just showed you. And again, the reason that we don't type the questions here is because a lot of these questions have pictures or images or diagrams associated with them. And those don't translate very well into Canvas. Sometimes students can't see the questions, in, I mean the pictures in Canvas. So we just don't put the questions themselves into the Canvas uh, system. We keep the questions themselves in a separate document. So when you open up this document on Monday morning and you're ready to take the exam, you're gonna find the questions on that sheet. You're gonna have to click on that sheet and open it up in its own window. There's gonna be 12 questions, 11 really, and one bonus question. You'll read the question on the sheet, but you'll type your answer into Canvas where it says so, okay? The other thing that's different about laboratory practical exams is that these are not multiple choice questions. These are all short answer questions. You don't have to worry about using full sentences and correct form in your paragraphs and things like that. That's not how it works, but they are short answer questions. So you won't have a choice of answers. You're gonna have to come up with the answer on your own. But again, you'll have your notes right next to you. 
So um, I think you'll find that it's not um, a lot more difficult than the lecture exam is, okay? And again, it's designed to test how well you are understanding and applying what you're learning in the laboratory. So it's a little bit different format, but it's all because we like pictures and images and diagrams and things like that in the laboratory. If you think, for example, about what we did the last time we were together, when we were talking about gram staining, towards the end of the lab, I asked you to look at some smears and tell me what the gram status was. Tell me if it was gram positive or gram negative. Tell me if you were looking at a caucus or a rod. Um, that's what I mean when I say there are gonna be images and things like that, pictures on lab practical exams. So that's coming up Monday morning. Now, one other thing I wanna mention, and this is just purely practical, you have this lab homework to do this week, just like always. When we finish with today's lab, you'll be ready to do your homework. You'll have everything you need to do your homework. I recommend getting your homework done sooner rather than later. You have until Sunday at midnight, it's true. But you have a lab practical exam Monday. So the sooner that you get your lab homework into me, the sooner I can put comments on it for, for you and get it back to you. And if you've got stuff in your lab notes that is perhaps incorrect, you'll be able to make adjustments. The sooner you get that homework done this week, the sooner you'll be able to get all of your lab notes in nice tidy order and you'll be all set to take the lab practical exam. Okay, that's my uh, recommendation to you. Now, let's leave the lab practical exam for a minute. Let's talk about the lecture exam. Just like last time, you've got this topic that you need to watch and then take a quiz for before you take the lecture exam. And the topic is a difficult one, acellular microbes, viruses and prions. The topics that we had before the first lecture exam, for many of you, not all of you, but for many of you were largely review. And all of you did well on the first lecture exam. I was very pleased to see that. All of you did very well on the first lecture exam. You may not feel that the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes lectures were purely review, you may have learned a few new things in there that you hadn't learned before. And I will tell you, for most of you at least, the virus lecture is gonna be brand spanking new. I don't know that too many of you have ever had any kind of virology in your education so far. So just like with the lab homework, my recommendation to you is to watch the viral lecture, watch the acellular microbes lecture as soon as you can. You're gonna to wanna to take your time watching it. It's a long lecture. It has five individual videos. It's a long lecture and it's brand new material for many of you. You're gonna need the time to watch it carefully and slowly and take good notes. So if you can do that, say this weekend, that would be ideal. If you have questions, you can certainly um, send me a, a message through Canvas and we can talk. You can post questions on the discussion board that's set up for questions. Um, it's a tough lecture. Because it's new material, if, if you've never learned about viruses, it's brand new material. So give yourself the time so that you're not madly trying to watch that lecture, let's say on Tuesday. Um, that's my recommendation, okay?
<laughs> just from someone who's been there in the past and knows how hard it is, um, that's my recommendation to you. So to summarize, next week for lecture, you have one topic, acellular microbes. The quiz is due Tuesday by midnight. For la uh, you have your lecture exam, sorry. You have your lecture exam on Wednesday. For laboratory, lab practical exam on Monday. No lab Zoom meeting on Monday. Okay. All right, everybody. If any questions come to mind, you can uh, jot them down in chat today while we're talking. Um, and if you have any questions that come up between now and Monday, you can just message me, okay? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our slides for today. And that's what you should be seeing right now, the title slide for aseptic technique. So our objectives for today are first to just define this term. What are we talking about when we talk about aseptic technique? We're gonna discuss why, why these techniques are used in the microbiology lab. And then finally, we're gonna talk about how, what, what, what is aseptic technique? How do we use it? How do we perform it while we're working in the laboratory? All aseptic technique is, when you hear someone talk about using aseptic technique, all it is, is all of the methods that we employ every day in the laboratory in order to prevent contamination. That's all we mean when we talk about aseptic technique. It's all of the little things that we're doing as we're working that are an effort to prevent contamination. Remember our number one goal, don't contaminate the culture with yourself and don't contaminate yourself with the culture. If you follow the basics of aseptic technique, you will be successful in that primary goal. We always have to remember that the microbes that we're handling every day in the laboratory range from completely harmless to pathogenic. And absolutely most of the things in the world in terms of microbes are completely harmless to us and even helpful to us, right? Part of our microbiome. But, but one to 5% approximately of the microbes out there are pathogenic. They are capable of causing disease in us. So we treat all microbes in the laboratory as though they were pathogens. We're gonna treat all of the pure cultures that we make, that we purposefully make and grow in the laboratory, we're gonna treat them as though they were pathogens because we don't necessarily get to know what we're handling. And there is a, there's a chance that what we're handling is pathogenic. So we just handle everything as though it was a pathogen. Now, we haven't talked a lot yet about how we purposefully grow microbes in the lab, how we culture microbes in the lab. You're gonna hear me talk about culturing and culture media a lot, this term. When we talk about culture media, all that means is some kind of material, whether it's a solid or a semi-solid or a liquid material that contains the nutrients and other things that microbes need in order to grow. We're gonna put microbes into culture media so that they can grow for us. We're gonna purposefully grow cultures of microbes. The terminology that we use is inoculation. We're going to inoculate the culture media with the microbes. And then we're going to allow that culture to grow. Now, 
inoculated media is incubated over some period of time in order to let that growth occur. Now, a lot of times what that means is we're gonna take the culture container that we have inoculated and we're gonna put it into an incubator because a lot of the microbes that we deal with prefer a warmer temperature. Incubators can provide whatever temperature we want. We can set them to a precise temperature. Incubators can also control what kind of gases the microbes get exposed to. We can choose just a room air mixture or we can increase certain gases like carbon dioxide. The other thing incubators do is they give the microbe a dark place. Most microbes do not want to be out in the sunshine or the room light because it's detrimental to their growth. So a lot of the times when we inoculate culture media and we incubate it, we're gonna do that in an incubator. But you're gonna see that there are other times when we incubate our cultures just on a countertop. We just set them aside on a countertop out in the room because just as there are some microbes that prefer a warmer temperature, there are other microbes that prefer room temperature. So it's still called incubation, even if it's done on a countertop in the laboratory. It's just the period of time that we're gonna allow our, our created cultures to grow. It's the period of time that we're giving those microbial cells to metabolize and to divide and make new cells. We have so many different culture media available to us in the laboratory. Not only can you purchase pre-made culture media, but you can also make your own. There are recipes upon recipes of different kinds of culture media that you can make in the laboratory for different microbes according to their own specific nutritional requirements. But here's the thing, growth media, so the media that's designed to let these microbes grow is going to let our desired microbe grow <laughs> but it would also allow a contaminant microbe to grow. We have to remember that. The culture media that we use will let any and all microbes that get into it grow. So if we accidentally allow a contaminant microbe to get into that container, the contaminant is gonna grow too. We've got to handle our culture media very, very carefully in order to protect it from getting contaminated with the wrong microbes. All right, any questions so far? Any questions about this terminology? Culturing or cultures, that's the word we use to describe these containers that we make in the laboratory that are full of some kind of a media, some kind of a solid or a semi-solid or a liquid that contains all of the good nutrients and things that microbes need to grow. And we're gonna design our recipe for our culture media to optimize growth. So sometimes we're adding in special carbohydrates or we may add in some kind of a special micronutrient because we know that the microbe we're trying to grow needs that in order to grow. Yeah, Connie, it's a lot like gardening. If you think about the, if you're a gardener and you think about the things that you do to help a particular plant grow, if you know that a particular plant needs the soil to be slightly acidic or another plant needs the soil to be very well drained, you know that if you meet those requirements for that plant, the plant is gonna grow really well for you. The same is true with culture media. 
we use the type of media that's going to help us be successful growing this microbe, making lots of this microbe. We are trying, though, to keep that culture pure. We just want that microbe in there, <laughs> not all kinds of other microbes. And what's hard is that that microbe is just like all microbes is going to be able to grow well in that culture container. It, um, if we keep with the gardening analogy, if you go out, if you've got um, a particular kind of plant growing in your garden and you want to fertilize that uh, soil for that plant, you're not going to fertilize everywhere, are you? <laughs> you're just going to fertilize around the plant. If you fertilize the whole garden, you're feeding other things. You're feeding the weeds, right? And they're going to grow really well for you <laughs> if you fertilize them. So it's a very similar idea. We want to do what we can to encourage the growth of the microbe we want and keep the other microbes away, keep the contaminating microbes away. All right. Now, this slide is very busy, busier than I like a slide to be. But I put all this together on the slide because these are what we would call the just the general rules. The general rules for culture media containers. So number one, we never leave a culture container whether it's an auger plate, that's a plate that has um, a solid media on it, or a tube that contains liquid broth, or any container for that matter. We're never going to leave those containers open any longer than absolutely necessary. We're going to open them when we need to either take cells out or put cells in, and then we're going to close them up again because we know that as long as they're open to the air, there's a chance that they're gonna get contaminated. Number two, we always assume that surfaces in the laboratory are contaminated. So we're never gonna place a sterile thing, a sterile tool onto a surface, even if we just disinfected that surface. Remember, when we come in in the morning, the very first thing we do is disinfect our workspace. If I then opened up a test tube full of culture broth, I am not going to put the top of that test tube down on my desktop. I'm going to assume that my desktop is contaminated. So I'm going to hold that top, that test tube top, in my fingers and keep it up off of the surface of the, of the workstation. We always have to remember that microbes fall out of the air. They don't jump up. So there's nothing that's gonna jump up and get into your media. It's all falling. It's swirling around in the air and it's falling down into your containers. Nearly all of the contamination that happens in the laboratory is coming from microscopic pieces of dust that are just circulating around in the air every day. We don't think about them, we don't notice them because they're microscopic. But the truth is our air contains particulate matter and microbes are sitting on those little particles. Contaminants are going to get into our containers when we're not careful. And because our containers are full of nutritious culture media, those contaminants are gonna to grow too. All right. This is another very busy slide. This is a, um, a collection of information about different kinds of waste containers. This is information that's really important to know when you're culturing microbes in the lab and doing other kinds of protocols in the microbiology lab. There's no really good place to talk about this information. So I've tucked it into today's material because it really is also part of what we do in the lab 
to prevent contamination. Maybe not contamination of our culture containers, but certainly contamination of ourselves and contamination of the environment that might impact our community. So what I have listed on here are the kinds of containers that we use in the microbiology lab for waste. And we're gonna say just a few things about each one. We've already talked about what we would call hazardous waste containers. For example, we've talked about how we have to save all of our waste stain and we have to put it into a container that can be picked up by professional uh, waste disposal people and disposed of correctly so it doesn't end up down the drain. Hazardous waste containers are in every single laboratory that handles chemicals, not just microbiology laboratories. Of course, there's a regular trash can in there too. So it's important to know what can I put in the regular trash and what needs to go into some special container. We've already mentioned a couple of these things. Gloves, for example, that we're always wearing in the microbiology lab. Gloves go into the regular trash. Remember, even though we assume that our gloves are contaminated, if they're on our hands and we are working in the micro lab, we assume that they're contaminated and we don't touch things that aren't routinely disinfected while we're wearing gloves. The truth is that at the end of the day, if there are bacteria on those gloves, they are not going to survive very long because gloves are by their nature, not supportive of growth. They're dry and they don't have any nutrient material on them. So even if there are bacteria on our gloves, they won't survive for very long. So we remove our gloves and we put them into the regular trash. Paper towels that we use, Kim wipes that we use, lens paper that we would use to clean our objective lenses. All of that kind of material goes in the regular trash can. Now you'll notice I have a couple of sharps containers listed. I'm gonna skip over that for just a minute and go down to where it says glass waste. We do handle glass a lot in the micro lab. Most of what we handle that is glass are microscope slides. And microscope slides, the ordinary ones, the ordinary type are single use items. So after we make a smear, for example, and we stain it and examine it, we're often going to want to dispose of it. Sometimes we keep microscope slides for a few days or weeks, but other times we're finished and it needs to be disposed of. Now, technically speaking, those microscope slides that have smears on them, those aren't a danger in terms of the microbes because during the process of making a smear, we're killing the microbes, right? We're killing the microbes by heat fixing them and we're killing them by staining them. So the hazard with a microscope slide is not the microbes. The hazard with a microscope slide is the glass. Microscope slides are thin and they're relatively fragile. We don't put them in the regular trash can because they tend to break, okay? So we have a special container called glass waste container. It's made out of thick, heavy cardboard and all of the glass that we dispose of goes into that box. So whether it's microscope slides or, or some broken glass, Perhaps we dropped a test tube or a beaker and it broke. We're only gonna put clean broken glass in the trash though. If it's broken glass that contained bacterial culture, that's contaminated. So we would wanna put that in the autoclave before we threw it away. But if it's clean broken glass, it can go right into the glass waste container. Then we have the autoclave. The autoclave is simply a machine that helps us sterilize materials using a combination of heat and pressure. 
think of it this way. Anything that has living microbial cells in it or on it that we want to throw away has to go through the autoclave first. And there are very special bags called biohazard bags. I'll show you what they look like in just a minute. We're going to package all of our used materials into the autoclave bags, the biohazard bags, and then we're going to autoclave them, and then we're going to throw them out. Once they've been autoclaved, they can go right into the regular uh, trash because they're no longer hazardous to anyone. Now, a lot of the glass that we use, the test tubes, the flask, the beakers, that stuff is reusable. As long as we don't drop it on the floor, like I said a minute ago, we can reuse those things. So what we do when we're finished with a glass container that holds culture, we're gonna get the culture out and make sure that gets into an autoclave bag. And then we're just gonna wash. We're gonna wash the glass container and then we're gonna autoclave it. Now, what we're doing there is not preparing that glass container to throw it away, but sterilizing it. Autoclaves sterilize. So sometimes in the micro lab, we're putting contaminated trash in an autoclave in order to kill the microbes so that we can throw it away. But other times we are sterilizing reusable materials. You know, in a hospital setting, those two things also occur. Any sort of biohazard waste, uh, patient body fluids or patient tissues, anything like that has to be autoclaved before it's disposed of so that it's not a potential source of contamination to anyone. But hospitals also autoclave reusable things, right? Think about, for example, uh, packs of surgical instruments. Those are reusable, so we clean them and then we pack them up and then we autoclave them, we sterilize them so they can be used again. Um, surgical gowns get autoclaved in order to be used again. So you can do two things with the autoclave. You can prepare trash to be thrown away by autoclaving it. And you can sterilize reusable instruments and materials so you can use them again. Autoclaves are an indispensable tool for us in microbiology. All right, let's take a minute and talk about Sharps containers. I know that most of you have experience working in the healthcare environment. So I know you all have seen Sharps containers. You've seen these red boxes that uh, people use to dispose of sharp things that come in contact with our patients. Needles, uh, scalpel blades, any kind of a single use sharp item that comes into contact with patients gets thrown away in that red box. Now that red box gets picked up by a professional waste disposal company. It will be autoclaved and then it will be disposed of. And that's because those sharp things, those needles and blades are touching humans' tissues, fluids and tissues, and are therefore potentially contaminated. Here's the thing that gets a little confusing. We actually have two kinds of Sharps containers in the micro lab. You may have encountered this in a doctor's office or a hospital setting as well, but you might not have. So I'm gonna just say a few words about it. There are two kinds of Sharps containers in the micro lab. There's what we refer to as the contaminated Sharps container and the non-contaminated or regular Sharps container. The red box that everybody has seen, that's the contaminated Sharps container. So any sharp single use object that has come into direct contact with one of our bacterial cultures is gonna go into that container, the contaminated Sharps container. But any single use item that is sharp 
that has not come in contact with microbes, that's going to go in the regular Sharps container. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why not just put everything in the red box? <laughs> if it's sharp, just throw it away in the Sharps container that you find in the doctor's office. Why not just do that? And the answer is money. <laughs> we pay to dispose of contaminated Sharps. Those red boxes, like I said, they get packaged up when they're full and they get picked up by people who are qualified to dispose of them. Sometimes that's done right at the hospital. Sometimes it's shipped off to somewhere else. It depends. But those red boxes, they're gonna be autoclaved and then they're gonna be disposed of as trash. That costs money, <laughs> that costs money. You also have to pay to have your hazardous waste containers hauled away and that costs money. So we're often trying to save our pennies in the laboratory. And if we don't need to put certain sharp items into those red boxes, we don't. So in laboratories, we're doing all kinds of strange things all the time. And sometimes we're using sharp things to do those things, but we're not touching any microbes. Those sharp things can get thrown out in basically a homemade sharps container. And I'm going to show you what those look like. The idea behind a non contaminated sharps container is very similar to the glass waste box. It's not that it's dangerous to anyone in terms of contamination, it's dangerous to people because it's sharp. So those sort of homemade regular sharps containers, those are just gonna go in the trash or they're gonna go down to the recycle center so they can be disposed of safely. We just don't wanna put needles and blades and things into the regular trash because somebody's gonna get cut. Somebody's gonna handle that trash, pick up that bag, do whatever, and somebody's gonna get cut. So instead, we make sure that those things are packaged into a container where they cannot cut someone, and then we throw them away. So Elaine, um, I'm gonna show you pictures of what we tend to use, and you're gonna get a laugh out of it because they really are homemade. <laughs> All right. Hold on just a sec. I'm skipping ahead a couple. So this is the Sharps containers that most of us are used to. It's a bright red box. It has a secured lid and it's got an opening for us to slip those single use sharp things that we need to throw away that have touched our patients. So again, needles that come off of syringes, uh, scalpel blades, any kind of sharp material that has touched a patient, body fluid, tissue, um, anything that's touched that we can put into this box. It's secure. It's not going to cut anybody. Notice the label. You see this little symbol right here? That is the universal symbol for a biohazard. So that's telling people that the sharp things that are in this box are potentially contaminated with microbes and could be a source of infection to someone who cut themselves with those materials. This is the box that has to be very carefully disposed of. It has to be autoclaved in order to kill all the potential microbes and then disposed of. These boxes come in all shapes and sizes. You'll find them attached to the wall in some places. They'll be sitting on the counter in other places, but they all have this same sort of universal look to them. These are contaminated Sharps containers. All right, let me skip ahead now to this page, which has my funny pictures on it. You have to buy these um, contaminated Sharps containers. So you have to lay out some money just for the box. And then, like I said, it has to be handled very carefully once it's full. It has steps have to be taken to decontaminate what's in here, and that involves autoclaving. So there's cost associated with these red boxes. 
In comparison, a non-contaminated single-use sharp object can be thrown away in one of these containers. And these are what you will see in microbiology labs. For example, this is an old liquid laundry detergent container. This is an old container that used to have coffee in it. These kinds of containers make perfect non-contaminated sharps. All you have to do is cut a hole into the lid so that people can slip the sharp things in. And when the container is full, it's ready to go in the trash. Now, we don't typically throw it right away in the trash can, but rather carry it to the recycle center, to the place where we can hand it to someone and say, this container is full of sharp things and I didn't wanna put them in the trash because I don't want anybody to get cut. Now, these non-contaminated sharps containers have to follow a couple of rules if you want to make them correctly. Let me tell you what those rules are. I've gone um, out of order here, so I'm just looking. All right, maybe I've gone the wrong way. Um, you want these containers to be opaque. In other words, you don't want to be able to see through them. And that's because um, it just, uh, you, you kind of want to hide the fact that they contain something very sharp, just in case um, it was um, enticing, say, to a child to open that container up and take something out. So we don't want you to be able to see through the container. That's number one. It needs to be a hard plastic. So a laundry container, a laundry detergent container is good any sort of hard plastic. You wouldn't want to use a soft plastic. Um, you also need it to have a lid. You're going to just put a slit in the lid so that you can put things in, but that it's not easy to get the things out. So a plastic trash bag is not a regular sharps container. It's too soft. That plastic material is just too soft. The sharp things are going to poke right out of there. We might as well just throw it in the trash can if you were going to use this bag. You would also not want to use an old milk jug for this because these are transparent. And when this thing is full to the brim of needles and blades and things, somebody might want somebody might try to take them out, maybe for nefarious uses, or um, a child might be attracted to this once it arrives at the um, recycle center. So we use um, a plastic that is hard and opaque and that has a cover on it. But that's all you have to do. It's very basic. And the key thing is that what's in there does not have any um, contamination potential. So these slides just uh, have in writing what I've already said. So don't worry about those. This is an image of that, whoops, this is an image of that glass waste container that I was talking about. And you may have seen these um, around the teaching laboratories, for example. This one happens to be made by Fisher Scientific, but all of the laboratory supply houses make these glass waste containers. This is a thick, heavy cardboard. It stands about three or four feet tall. It's got a lid on it, as you can see, also made of cardboard. And there's a slit in the top where you drop in your microscope slides or your clean broken glass. So again, this is designed not to protect people from contamination. There's nothing contaminated in here that's going to harm anyone. This is designed to protect us from sharp glass. All right. Questions, questions about those things. Yeah, Elaine is saying that she keeps a little cardboard container at home for her sharps. I do the same thing, Elaine. I keep an old plastic water bottle that I put anything sharp that I've been using and I need to throw away. Um, uh, my son does uh, woodworking and things. So the, the old jigsaw blades go into that bottle. Um, anything that is sharp that we're that we need to throw away we put into that bottle and then we will carry that to the recycle center and hand it to the attendant 
Um, you don't want to put really sharp things into a trash bag because somebody's going to get cut. Somebody's going to accidentally pick that bag up and get cut. And um, you don't want that to happen. So it's a good idea. All right. Very good. So again, a little bit about waste containers, just so you know the different kinds of containers we use in the laboratory. It's really important to know how to handle your waste because you want to be careful not only for yourself and the other personnel in the laboratory, but you also want to be careful for your community. You don't want to do anything in the course of your work that's going to put somebody in your community at risk. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna do is watch a video together that talks through the types of aseptic technique that we use specifically in the microbiology laboratory. When we're working in the microbiology lab, we are often moving bacterial cells from one place to another, from one media to another. And there are different reasons that we do this, but we always have to use our very best aseptic technique while we're transferring cells so that we don't cause contamination to occur. Now, there are lots of reasons why we would take cells out of one culture container and move them to another. One of the most common reasons we do this is because cultures get old. Remember, when we put cells into, for example, a broth culture, there's a certain limited number of nutrient molecules in there. And as the bacterial cells start to grow and divide, they're gonna use up those available nutrients. They're also gonna be excreting waste materials into that culture tube. And that's gonna be dangerous to the survival of the bacterial cells. So from time to time, if we wanna keep a culture going, we have to take some cells out of the old culture and move them into fresh media so that they can begin to grow and divide again with plenty of nutrients and plenty of space. We call that process subculturing. When you take cells out of an, out of an existing culture and you move them into fresh media, we call that subculturing. Now, as you've seen, there are really two primary types of culture containers that we encounter most often in the laboratory. There are test tubes, and those can have liquid media in them. They can have a semi-solid media in them. They can even have solid auger in them. The other container we see is the Petri dish, the plastic single-use lidded dish. We often refer to these as plates. And those auger plates have a thin layer of solid media on the bottom. So those are the two containers that we encounter the most, and those are the two containers that we move cells between most often. So what we'll look at in this video is how to do all of that moving <laughs> using our very best aseptic technique. Set up in the workspace here, there's an incinerator that's been plugged in and is nice and hot. And there's an inoculating loop. The inoculating loop must be sterile because we would never lay a contaminated inoculating loop on the desktop like this. The only other piece of equipment that I'm gonna to need to do this demonstration is a Bunsen burner. I don't have access to a Bunsen burner today. So I'm going to use something as a substitute just for demonstration purposes. And that something is a bottle of hot sauce. That seems appropriate. 
a good substitute for a Bunsen burner. Now, the next thing I need is a broth tube. And I want you to notice that it's a glass tube. We've talked about how to open up any test tube with culture in it by holding it at an angle and by holding on to the top of the tube in our fingers. What we need to remember is that the inside of a sterile tube of uninoculated broth is still sterile until we place something into it. The outside of the tube though, once you have touched it, it is no longer sterile. Now, when we're working with a glass test tube, we can take an extra step to protect the sterility inside that nutrient broth tube. And that's to flame the mouth of the test tube when we open it, you know, before we handle it, before we put culture material in, and also flame it again before we close it. Now I'm gonna show you what I mean by flame it. This is something we can do using aseptic technique to add an extra layer of protection against contamination. People don't always flame glass test tubes. Sometimes it's just too time consuming of a procedure, but I wanna show it to you because it is, again, an extra layer of protection against accidental contamination. You would never do this with a plastic test tube though, of course, because you would melt the plastic. So the test tube that I'm holding in my hand has a liquid broth in it, a nutrient media, and bacterial cells growing in it. And I'm going to take a sample of those cells out of this tube, and I'm going to flame the mouth of the tube before and after I remove those cells. So you'll notice that I'm gonna take the cap off. I'm gonna hold the tube at an angle, just like always. But here's the extra step. I'm gonna pass the neck of that tube, the mouth of that tube, through that flame. Let's take a look at that again. Remember, the bottle of hot sauce is my Bunsen burner. And we're pretending there's a flame coming out of that black cap. So I'm gonna take the neck, the open part, the mouth, if you will, of that test tube, and I'm simply gonna pass it through the flame. Now, what does that achieve for me? The opening to the test tube is the place that's most vulnerable to a contaminating microbe falling in. My hands are up near the mouth of that tube when I'm taking the cap off. And of course, I'm also a source of contaminating microbes, even with gloves on. So by flaming that opening to the tube, what I'm doing is I'm applying heat directly to the glass. So if there's any microbes sort of right on the lip of that opening, I'm killing those. I'm also briefly warming up the air that's in the mouth of that tube. And by doing that, I actually create a little current, a little swirling current of hot air. And just for a moment or two, that's gonna protect the tube. It's going to prevent anything from falling down out of the air and going into the tube. So I've created a few moments of protection from accidental contamination. Now, after I'm finished doing whatever it is I'm gonna do with the tube, I'm gonna pass it through again before I put the cap back on. Again, if I have accidentally introduced any microbes during my procedure, I just killed them. And I've created a little current of air right at the end, just in case there were any microbes hovering over that area, that opening. I've killed them with that heat. It's a very brief pass through the flame. 
it's going to kill cells that might be on the lip, the outer lip of that tube that might be a source of contamination. And it's going to create a current of hot air just in the mouth of the tube, just for a couple of seconds, that will keep that entryway free of contaminating microbes. Now we're going to watch a transfer of cells from one tube to another tube. This tube has my bacterial culture in it. Okay, and this tube has clean nutrient broth in it. Notice that I put the clean broth tube up higher in my hand. I'm going to widen our view here a little bit. Now, the other thing I'm going to need is a Bunsen burner. And of course, I don't have one. So I'm going to substitute in my bottle of hot sauce. Okay. Now, first thing I'm going to do is sterilize my inoculating loop. That needs to be into the incinerator until the wire is red hot. For purposes of the demonstration, I'm going to shorten that up a little bit. I'll pretend that we're red hot. Now we have to hold it until it cools off. Remember, approximately 20 seconds. You can count in your head. Now it's important that you get that loop comfortable in your hand for the next part. I've got my tubes at an angle. I'm going to take off both caps. And the reason I do that is because I'm going to be flaming. So I'm going to flame the culture tube first. Now I'm going to take out a sample from the culture tube. I'm going to flame it again. And now I'm ready to close the culture tube. Take one of your caps and put it on. Flame the clean broth tube. Place your sample into your plain broth tube. Swirl it around a little just to make sure it all gets in there. Flame it again. Close it with a cap. Remember, your loop is dirty right here, so don't forget to put it back into the incinerator to sterilize it once again. If you're working in a laboratory that doesn't use open flame, you can still do a successful broth to broth transfer using your best aseptic technique. You're just going to want to remember to hold both tubes at an angle while they're open. You're going to want to avoid touching the neck or the lip of the tube as much as possible. And you're going to want to close those tubes just as soon as possible to help prevent any accidental contamination. Now let's take a look at the next kind of transfer, which is from a broth tube to an auger plate. Remember, we use plastic single use Petri dishes in the microbiology lab, and we can pour auger into those dishes and allow it to solidify, giving us a solid media to work with. We refer to those as auger dishes or auger plates. The auger, the solid material, has nutrients added into it so that the bacteria can grow. So this is an auger plate. This happens to have nutrient auger on it. You can just see it. It's a thin sort of beige film on the bottom of the plate. Now I'm taking the lid off just so you can see the inside of the plate. There's just this beige sort of sheen to that media. Very, very thin layer of media in here. Um, it feels a lot like gelatin. Um, and it's easy to push your loop into that gelatin. So you have to be careful when you're handling it. Oh, I've mentioned before that we handle auger plates upside down. We put auger plates into the incubator to allow bacterial cells to grow upside down. In other words, we want the auger, that solid media, to be at the very top once it's upside down. And what this does is it allows any condensation that might develop inside that nice warm incubator. It allows it to drip off of the surface of the auger and onto the lid of the plate. 
this is helpful when we're trying to grow bacteria because that condensation might interfere with the growth of bacterial cells on the agar surface. So we handle them upside down, we um, open and close them upside down, and we place them into the incubator upside down. I'm gonna move my incinerator into place here as I get going, my inoculating loop, my tube full of bacterial culture. Now, this inoculating loop is clean, it's sterile, and I want you to notice that I'm going to start bending this wire. The wire is wire for a reason. When we're um, inoculating things, especially the surfaces of plates, we can bend this wire to make it easier to spread the cells out. Now you can bend it as far as you want or as little as you want. It really depends on the person handling the loop. But once you bend it into place, you can still get it into the incinerator bent because it's very flexible. It's a wire. So you would heat up the wire just as you always would. See, the bend is still in it. You're gonna let it cool. If you have it bent as severely as I do here, once you open up your culture, which I'm doing here, you're just gonna wanna be very careful as you introduce the loop. Again, you don't want to touch the neck of the tube. Take out some of your culture material. Close your culture. Now you're ready to go. So I'm going to open this dish. Again, it's upside down. And I'm going to keep the plate at an angle so that I can put these cells on the surface. I'm going to place the loop on the surface and I'm going to make a nice zigzaggy motion all the way across. I'm going to take my loop, remember, incinerate, sterilize, get rid of those cells. So essentially what I've done is I took a bunch of cells out of the culture tube, the broth, and I placed them onto the first place that I hit on that auger. I put a, a a large number of cells, a large amount of cells onto the surface. And then by sliding my loop across the surface, back and forth and back and forth, what I'm doing is I'm spreading those cells across the surface of the plate. So that I'm giving them room to grow on that nice nutrient rich solid media. Let's take a look at that again. Lid com uh, plate comes up, loop touches the media, and then without lifting it, I'm going to just streak it out, streaking it back and forth in a zigzag motion, spreading out those cells. As we go through the summer and we look at other techniques that we use in the microbiology laboratory, we'll also look at different ways that we can streak an auger plate depending on what we want to achieve in terms of the growth of the cells. Now, anytime you open a container that has growth media in it, nutrient media or any, kind, any other kind of media, remember what we said, you wanna keep that container open for as, as short amount of time as possible you want to quickly get it inoculated with cells and then you want to close it again because you want to prevent contamination. Now, different people use different techniques to achieve this. You can open and close an agar plate a couple of different ways using aseptic. Here's an agar plate that's being held right side up. And in this technique, we're going to use the lid to keep the plate partially covered. See that? I can reach in between with my loop and do my streaking pattern, close it, and then put it upside down. Let's look at that again. I'm going to keep the plate right side up, use the lid as partial protection from microbes falling onto it, streak it, close it, back upside down. Now let's take a look at a couple of ways that you don't want to handle your auger dish. 
first of all, you never want to just open up an auger plate and hold it straight up to the air like this. You're just asking for contamination to fall onto that plate. So don't do that. You also don't want to do the other extreme, which is keeping it completely upside down and trying to inoculate it. You will push your loop into that auger if you do that. What you want to do is open up the plate and hold it at an angle like this. You can get access to the surface. You can get your streaking done, get the plate closed. You're good to go. The last thing I want to talk about today isn't directly related to aseptic technique, but it's the tools that we have available in addition to what we've talked about already. These are single use disposable inoculating loops. They come in a sterile package of about 50. When you open up these packages and you pull out the loop, you can see the handle end is what's going to come out first. So you widen up the mouth of the bag and you carefully pull this out and you've got a sterile loop at the end. Now, some people don't like uh, these single use inoculating loops. They are not nearly as flexible as a wire loop. And obviously, they're a single use plastic item. So you can imagine that when they're being used in a busy microbiology lab, hundreds of them are being used every day and discarded into the landfill. So some people are opposed to their use. Um, it's a problem in all of laboratory work that we use a lot of plastic. We use a lot of single use plastic disposable materials. Um, and hopefully at some point we will get away from that. But this is a tool that's available to us. And some people really like these because it speeds up their work. This loop um, allows you to, to do a single transfer of material and then just toss it into the autoclave bag. You don't need to take the time to put your loop, your metal loop, into the incinerator, wait for it to get hot, then take it out, wait for it to cool. Instead, you just grab a brand new disposable loop. So again, it depends on the lab you're working in, whether or not you'll be using reusable metal inoculating loops or these single use items. Well, the next item that we can look at is the disposable cotton swab. Those are very useful in the microbiology lab. They come in these sterile packages. There's usually two swabs in the package. You can only open these packages at one end. And again, just like with the loops, that allows you to open the package at the end opposite to the swab. So if you carefully manipulate the package here so that um, the opening is a little bit wider, you can pull the swab out carefully and you've got a nice sterile surface. So you can take culture material up with a cotton swab and use it the way you would use an inoculating loop. When you're done, you can simply toss that swab in the trash. Remember, transfer pipettes also come in these single-use sterile packages. When you open these up, you're going to first see the bulb end. And again, you want to open these carefully and pull them out carefully. But now the end that will touch your liquid broth is sterile. You can pull up um, a larger volume with these than you could with an inoculating loop, which makes them very nice. Um, very inexpensive, very widely available, very widely used, these transfer pipettes. Next on the list of tools is one of my favorites. This is called a hockey stick. Now you can buy a reusable glass hockey stick, but this is the disposable variety. Now watch what this stick is going to allow me to do. 
we've looked at how we streak cells across a petri dish, an auger dish. But sometimes we want to make a smooth coating of cells over the surface of that dish. And that's what the hockey stick does. See, you just swirl it around like the hands of a clock face and you will spread your cells all over the surface of that plate nice and evenly. One of my favorite tools in microbiology. At the end of the day, when we finished our work, it's critical that we know where to dispose of our materials. And of course, when it comes to the materials that touch culture, we need an autoclave bag. This red bag has a biohazard symbol on it and it clearly says on it, it's an autoclave bag. So this bag is where we put used culture related materials, the things that have touched living bacterial culture or microbial culture, our auger plates, our cotton swabs that we might have dipped into culture, um, our disposable um, transfer pipe pads that may have drawn up culture, um, the, the cotton swabs, the hockey sticks, all of these things that have touched living cells that we cannot put in the incinerator because they're disposable. Uh, we're gonna put in the bag, we're gonna wrap that bag up with a tie, and that bag is going to go into the autoclave. Now, we haven't talked about the autoclave yet. We haven't talked about the process of autoclaving, but for now, understand that in the autoclave, a very high temperature is reached and a very high pressure is reached. And any cell and any spore that's inside that autoclave is going to be destroyed at that high temperature and pressure combination. Once the material comes out of the autoclave, it is ready to be thrown into the regular trash. All right. So, so we've got techniques that we use in the microbiology lab in order to do our work every day. Techniques that protect us from getting contaminated with our culture and that protect our culture from getting contaminated with us or getting contaminated with microbes that are up in the air. These techniques are not difficult. They can be a little awkward when you're first learning them. It's awkward, for example, to hold two test tubes in one hand. But we have to do it because the other hand has to hold the loop. So we just try to do it one way every time. And once you do these techniques, you pick them up and they become part of your muscle memory. The way we handle Petri dishes, the way we protect them from getting contaminated, it becomes part of your muscle memory. Elaine's asking if autoclaves are similar to pressure cookers. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a magic combination, heat and pressure. You know, heat is very useful for sterilizing things. We use heat every day, don't we? We use heat to cook. And part of what we're doing when we cook is we're killing microbes that might be in that food. When you add pressure to that, um, obviously with a pressure cooker, it makes the cooking faster, which is very nice, but um, pressure also helps to kill microbes. And so that's what makes autoclaves so useful to us. It's the combination of the heat and the pressure. And again, we're gonna talk about autoclaving in a couple weeks, but one of the problems with just using heat, heat is really effective against vegetative cells, but heat alone will not destroy a spore, an endospore. Remember, those are very resistant. They are, the, the, their purpose is to protect the DNA until environmental conditions improve. So heat alone is not gonna destroy spores. 
So if you are really trying to sterilize something, you got to add the pressure in. So yeah, very similar to a pressure cooker. It's just on a much larger scale. Autoclaves are just bigger than that. So yeah, and um, the other thing that was in the video that I want to just emphasize is the idea that when we use our auger plates, we always handle them upside down. We keep them upside down. And the reason for that is condensation. So we're putting the cells across the surface of the auger. The cells are sitting on top of the auger. And if you were to put that plate with its lid, if you were to put that into the incubator, what will happen is you'll get condensation forming on the lid. And that condensation is going to drip down onto the auger. And that's going to interfere with the cell's ability to grow on the auger. It's going to interfere with their growth. So instead, we flip the plate upside down. Any condensation that forms on the auger will drip down onto the lid. And we'll keep the auger free of you know, puddles of condensation. So we just handle them upside down. We put them in the incubator upside down and we um, take care of that problem that way. And, um, and as, as we saw in that video, there are different techniques that people have developed. Um, and depending on which technique feels best in your hands, you can do one or the other. So, you know, some people like to do that sort of a clamshell technique. They like to use the lid of the Petri dish to partially protect the auger surface while they're working with the plate. Um, some people find it very awkward. They just don't like handling the lid. So instead, they lift the bottom of the plate up and just hold it at an angle. Um, and it, it really does. It just takes a little practice for you to figure out which one feels more natural in your hands. All right, very good. Does anybody have any questions about anything that we talked about today? Does anybody have any questions about what aseptic technique is? Aseptic technique is everything that we do. It's everything that we do to keep that golden rule. Don't contaminate yourself. Don't contaminate your culture. So all those little things that we do, keeping the test tube at an angle, keeping the cap in your finger, in your fingers, instead of putting it down on the desk, holding the auger plate at an angle, flaming a glass test tube if that's practical for you to do, incinerating your loop before you use it and after you use it so that you don't contaminate your workspace. All of those things go into what we call aseptic technique. We're just trying to prevent contamination in everything we do, <laughs> everything we do in the laboratory. All right, very good. All right, so remember that you have those two lectures to finish this week and two uh, lecture quizzes. You've got lab homework to do now. And I recommend you get that lab homework done sooner rather than later. Because the other thing I recommend you do as soon as you can is get into that lecture called acellular microbes, viruses and prions. That lecture has a quiz associated with it, and that quiz is not due until Tuesday at midnight. But I recommend you get that lecture watched, get your notes taken, get your quiz done as soon as you can. Because if you miss anything on the quiz, I'll leave a comment for you. And you can then adjust your notes so that you're ready for the lecture exam. The lecture exam is going to cover prokaryotes, eukaryotes, 
and acellular microbes. And that takes place next Wednesday. The lecture exam is gonna look just like the first lecture exam. On Monday, you have a laboratory practical exam. That one's gonna look a little different because the questions are gonna be in a separate document. You're still gonna type your answers into Canvas, but the questions will be on that separate document. That practical exam is gonna cover everything we've done in laboratory since the beginning of the course. No Zoom meeting on Monday, because you've got your lab practical exam to take. You can have your lab notes right at your side while you take that practical exam. You can take it any time during the day from 7 a.m. onward, as long as you get it to me by 8 p.m. We will have a Zoom meeting on Wednesday, even though you have a lecture exam on Wednesday. We will meet for Zo over Zoom on Wednesday. All right. So I won't see you again for a whole week, <laughs> which means if you have any questions, you need to message me through Zoom, through Zoom, through Canvas. <laughs> any questions at all that come up, send me a message through Canvas. Remember, if you send me a message straight to email, it will take me just a little bit longer to get it. If you message me through Canvas, if you go to the inbox function in our Canvas course, that will send your message to the top of my email, <laughs> which is great because then I'll get it quicker. All right, everybody. So you've got a little uh, extra time today to yourself. We're finishing a little bit early, which is great because um, I've kept you late a couple times too. So I'm gonna let you go. Enjoy the rest of the day. Good luck on your exams next week. You're gonna do fine. And I will see you then. <laughs>